Okay, here's the representative cast of characters for the show today. Rembrandt will be the primary hero. We just began his career last time, and we have almost all of his most important pictures yet to see. But he wasn't the only great painter in Holland in the 17th century. We'll also hear today about Franz Hals, famous for his portraits, and Jakob van Roystal, often regarded as the greatest landscape painter ever. Heinrich Schutz did not spend much time in Holland, but he was the greatest composer in Europe in Rembrandt's day, and there is even a portrait attributed to Rembrandt of someone alleged by some to be Schutz, so some think they may even have met. So this is the anatomy lesson of Dr. Tulp, which we saw at the end of class last time and which Rembrandt painted at the age of just 26 in 1632, soon after moving to Amsterdam, where he would spend the rest of his life. He had already made the acquaintance of an art dealer there named Hendrik van Eulenburg, and apparently he made an arrangement which allowed him to both live and work in van Eulenburg's establishment, which specialized actually in making copies, and more than a few copies of Rembrandt's pictures were eventually to be made there, some of which are likely still passing as Rembrandt's own in various collections. Van Eulenburg had a cousin, Saskia, who was the orphan daughter of a wealthy merchant and politician, and she and Rembrandt may well have met in Van Eulenburg's home. They were in any case married in 1634. As I said last time, Rembrandt became a rich man in the 1630s, painting mostly portraits, and we're going to see some representative ones now while we hear a keyboard piece by Jan Peterson Svelink, often considered the greatest Dutch composer. He was the organist at the Autokirk in Amsterdam in the early 17th century and was the teacher of Heinrich Scheidemann, some of whose work we'll hear shortly, and who was himself the teacher of Jan Adam Rankin, who was briefly the teacher of Johann Sebastian Bach. This is an arrangement for harpsichord of a song by Svelink called Ich fuhr mich über Rhein. Simon Schama thinks this portrait of Nicholas Roots is actually Rembrandt's very first commissioned portrait. Roots was a wealthy fur trader at the time. He's wearing sable here, but he went bankrupt a few years after the picture was painted. This is Rembrandt's portrait of the fellow now simply called a militia man in the Legion of Honor in San Francisco. This is another of his earliest portraits, and it's one of the few things in that museum, which places like the Rijksmuseum or the Moritzois would really like to have. This is the same kind of fellow, a sort of military reservist, who will populate the great night watch, which we'll see later. Here he is up closer. This is Nicholas van Bambeck in the Brussels Musée de Beaux-Arts. He was married to this woman, Agatha Bass, known as the Lady with the Fan in the Queen's Collection at Windsor. The Mennonite preacher Cornelis Anslow, probably discussing some point of scriptural exegesis with his wife. Here are the books on the table. This picture is in Berlin. And this is a shipbuilder named Rickson, also in the Queen's collection. And this is a close-up of Rembrandt's portrait of the frame maker, Hermann Dumer, in the New York Metropolitan Museum. Simon Schama's comment on this picture is that it shows how much Rembrandt was the master of the middle-aged eyelid. This 
now is the famous man with the golden helmet in Berlin whose identity is unknown, nor is it known who painted him, though the picture is now usually attributed at least to the circle of Rembrandt, and he was to have many pupils, apprentices, assistants of various kinds. And despite the ongoing work of the Rembrandt Research Committee, there is still a lot of controversy about what artist or artists painted many alleged Rembrandts. And here's Rembrandt's new wife, Saskia van Eulenburg. Simon Schama says she was not as rich as some have thought, but her inheritance combined with Rembrandt's own income certainly made them a wealthy young couple. This is a self-portrait now by Rembrandt which he painted the year of his marriage. He was 28 and Saskia was 22 at the time. Simon Schama emphasizes in his book on Rembrandt how much he wanted to imitate and equal the success of Rubens. And artistically and financially, he was well on his way to doing that by this time. I think, at least in his 20s, he may also have wanted to be as handsome as Rubens, but he just didn't have as much to work with and he was much too much of a realist to give himself better looks than he really had. The member of the House of Orange who was Stadtholder of the United Provinces at this time was Frederick Henry, grandson of William the Silent, and his secretary and right-hand man was Constantine Huygens, a member of one of the most famous families in Dutch history. And this is a portrait of the latter by Jan Lievens, with whom Rembrandt had been closely associated in Leiden, and who had also been a pupil of Lastman in Amsterdam. Constantine was a great admirer of the work of both Lievens and Rembrandt, and was influential in getting the latter to move to Amsterdam. He was also an accomplished scholar, poet, and musician, and you're hearing a song by him called Ne Cré Point Le Seren, Don't Fear the Evening Dew. This is Rembrandt's portrait now of Moritz Huygens, Constantine's brother. Constantine's son was the famous scientist Christian Huygens, but this is the only member of the family Rembrandt himself painted, and Schama refers to this picture as Rembrandt's notorious portrait of Moritz, and suggests that his brother Constantine may have been influenced by it to look for someone else to recommend to his friends who wanted portraits. Moritz himself also later published some verses which were critical of Rembrandt's portrait painting skill. But I believe Will Durant says somewhere that this is his favorite. In any case, it's in the Louvre now. This is Van Dyck's portrait of the Stadtholder Frederick Henry himself now, and this is probably more the sort of thing that Moritz Huygens might have wanted. Frederick Henry himself owned at least three paintings by Rembrandt, which Constantine had bought for him, however, and it was probably Constantine Huygens who influenced him to have Rembrandt paint a series of pictures illustrating the Passion in the 1630s. However, before we see Rembrandt's version of the Raising of the Cross, which was part of that commission, I want to just glance back here for a minute at the version of that subject painted by Rubens which we saw last week. It is, as I said, full of what I called Catholic optimism, the feeling that what is happening is triumphant and heroic and makes salvation possible for anyone who will make the effort to win it. The emphasis is on the divine character of Jesus, not on any human suffering he might have undergone. Here now is Rembrandt's version, which is very different, and is essentially painted from the much more pessimistic viewpoint of the Calvinist Dutch Reformed Church. And you're hearing Constantine Huygens' setting of Psalm 119, O Lord, I have gone astray. Here the emphasis is not on heroism, but on pathos, not on triumphant sacrifice by hero God, but on the death of Jesus, the human being, the man. The lighting is as dramatic as in Rubens' picture, I think, but the effect is to make the atmosphere one of sadness rather than hope. Oh. 
In a very Calvinist touch, Rembrandt uses himself as the model for one of those raising the cross. The man in blue, as though to say, I'm as guilty as the men who actually crucified him. I'm no better than they are. I'm a sinner who can only hope to gain salvation because of God's goodness, not my own. Eravi Domini. Here's the deposition now, and again, there is nothing heroic about it. Simon Shama says Rembrandt makes the body of Jesus look like a dislocated sack of organs, which, if a bit flippant, is true enough. Rembrandt had hoped that the Passion series would lead to his being made something like court painter for Frederick Henry, but that didn't happen. The Stadtholder was apparently satisfied, but not overwhelmed. Although he did buy a couple of expensive pictures from Rembrandt many years later, he gave him no more large commissions. Rembrandt was very grateful to Huygens for his part in arranging the commission and sent him this painting as a gift, the gruesome blinding of Samson on a ten-foot wide canvas. This is not the kind of subject most people would want on the wall over a dining room table, however. In fact, Huygens apparently tried to refuse the thing. I can imagine him asking if Rembrandt didn't have nice still life around. He could perhaps have instead nice bowl of fruit, vase of flowers, something like that. Rubens and Rembrandt are both classified as Baroque painters, but Rembrandt subjects are usually a good deal less packed with superficial action anyway, superficially less theatrical than those of Rubens. This is probably the picture by Rembrandt, which is the most Baroque in the Rubensian sense. Kenneth Clark says it took a genius to paint something as thoroughly horrible as this. This now is an antique statue of Ganymede in the Vatican. Ganymede was the handsome young man abducted by Zeus to serve as his cupbearer on Mount Olympus, and typical representations of him, both ancient and modern, are idealized treatments of the male nude. This is Cellini's Italian Renaissance version. Rembrandt was influenced in various ways by both ancient and Renaissance art, but he had no interest whatever in the kind of superficial idealization of the human body that was so much a part of these traditions. Kenneth Clark calls the blinding of Samson, as I said, thoroughly horrible, and he calls Rembrandt's Ganymede one of the most disgusting things ever by a great artist. And here he is now. I think the purpose of this is clearly primarily just to ridicule the classical and Renaissance idealization of the male nude, and perhaps according to Shami anyway, to condemn the supposed rampant homosexuality associated with those eras, and it's hard to imagine how he could have done it more memorably. People who don't know the point he's making with this picture must just wonder what on earth he painted this for, and even when the point is understood, it's still not clear why he would have gone to so much trouble to make it. Rembrandt wrote nothing that would shed any light on this or any other aesthetic issue, it's essentially a kind of editorial cartoon you see here that would only have been bought by someone who shared Rembrandt's attitude toward the pretty and the ideal, but we don't know who, if anyone, commissioned it, or who, if anyone, bought it. And what about the female nude? Well, Sir Kenneth Clark says this nude on a mound, as she is called, has the most deplorable body imaginable. I don't know, I could imagine worse, but this certainly seems to a modern eye far from any sort of idealization. If Rubens' idea was to avoid the charge of being a pornographer by painting women who were too large, Rembrandt's here seems to have been to avoid the charge by simply making his nudes too ugly, I guess. I'm sort of haunted though by the thought that Rembrandt may actually have thought that this woman was attractive. In his commentary on this etching, Simon Shama obviously seems to think that, in fact, he really did think that very thing, hard as it is to believe. Here's another etching subject that is hardly of the sort that an Italian Renaissance artist in his right mind would ever have used for a work of art. This fellow is a door-to-door -door rat catcher. 
the Orkin man of his day. The fact that this was one of Rembrandt's most popular etchings must say something about the nature of art or about the Dutch. It certainly makes the point that I've often made before that a genius can make a work of art out of anything. It's the artist, not the subject, that makes the masterpiece. This is the kind of subject, uh, along with, I think, the Ganymede and probably the Nude on the Mound, too, along with a lot of other things by him, some of which are truly X-rated, which often seem together to put him closer to Peter Bruegel than Peter Paul Rubens. This is Amsterdam now, where Rembrandt lived almost all of his adult life, and which was, by the 1630s, with a population of around 300,000 people, one of the largest and most prosperous cities on earth. In this picture looking west, you can see where Rembrandt's house is, although the area around it now looks very different than it did at the time of this photo, relatively recent though it is. Near Rembrandt's house is the Zuiderkirk, built by Hendrik de Keyser. It was the first church to be built for Protestants in Amsterdam. Rembrandt had three children who all died soon after birth, and they were buried in this church. Swaling played the organ at the Autokirk, and Saskia will be buried there. After his bankruptcy, Rembrandt was to move, as we'll see, to the neighborhood of the Westerkirk at the upper left, and will be buried in that church. You can also see the town hall, which was built in his lifetime, and the new church, as it's called, the decades-long restoration of which has just been completed. You can also see the Dolan Hotel, which is where the headquarters of the Cloveneers Dolan was when Rembrandt painted the night watch for them. At the time Rembrandt was born, the city walls still stood along the Cloveneers Berg Wall and the single, but the city was expanding rapidly beyond them, especially to the northwest, where you could see the outer canals dug in his day, and which circle around the city from the northwest to the southeast. Two parts of the old walls still survive, the Munt or Mint Tower and the Vog Gate. This is an etching Rembrandt made, which shows the city from the northeast, looking past the warehouses of the Dutch East India Company, and the Autokirk and the Zuiderkirk at the left. In his book, The Embarrassment of Riches, Simon Schama makes the interesting point that the Dutch were the first Christians in history to be so universally prosperous that they could buy luxuries with a clear conscience because no one, at least no Dutchman, was without the basic necessities of life. According to this view, the purpose of charity wasn't to level society, it was just to make sure that everyone had a place to live and enough to eat. You don't need to feel sorry for people who don't have HDTVs and Land Rovers. And here you can see the old harbor as it looks now. By Rembrandt's time, the Dutch had the largest merchant fleet in the world with trading outposts from Manhattan to Indonesia and South America to Japan. While we see some more of Amsterdam as Rembrandt knew it, We'll hear the Canzone in F by Heinrich Scheidemann, who, as I mentioned earlier, was a pupil of Swalink. This is the way the old town hall looked when Rembrandt was born. The picture's by Jakob van der Olft. And here is Garrett Burkheide's picture of the new town hall on the damn square, built during Rembrandt's lifetime by Jakob van Kampen, who also built some oratories in The Hague. These are among the first Dutch buildings to show a lot of classical influence. Rembrandt painted the oath of the Batavians for this building, and the night watch was here for many years. We'll see both of these later. The Gothic New Church, as it's called, is on the right. And here's the damn square today. The town hall is also called the Royal Palace, but it's not the actual residence of King Willem Alexander. This is called the Citizens Hall inside.
This is the Vesterkirk, the church where Rembrandt was buried, built by Hendrik de Keyser, who is usually regarded as the greatest Dutch sculptor. But that isn't saying much. The Dutch are painters, not sculptors. De Keyser made the Tomb of William the Silent we saw earlier this quarter, and he also built the Delft Town Hall, which we'll see later. This is the house of Andries de Graaf, whose portrait by Rembrandt we'll see later. This is the so-called House on the Three Canals, one of the largest private residences of Rembrandt's day. And this is part of the former Beginhof. You can tell how prosperous Amsterdam was from the fact that this is where poor people lived. Notice the hoists on the gables, what we would call a, a ladder in Amsterdam is called a staircase, and to get anything larger than a bread box up to a top floor, it has to be hoisted up on the outside and through the windows. The oldest house in Amsterdam is said to be this one on the grounds of the Beginhof, built in the late 16th century. In this picture you can see the three typical gable styles, the 16th century step gable at the left and the 17th century bell and neck gables to the center and right. In the 18th century many Dutch houses got triangular classical style pediments like the one we'll see added to Rembrandt's house shortly. And this is the so-called Vog Gate, the Wayhouse Gate, Tollbooth Gate, one of the surviving parts of the old 16th century wall around the city on the Kloveniersburg Wall. We'll take a quick look at this building, which is in The Hague, and which is also the work of Jacob van Kempen, the fellow who built the Amsterdam Town Hall. And it's in a similarly classical style, with triangular pediments on the roof and over the windows, pilasters and garlands. This is the Maritzhuis, and it is now, of course, one of the great museums of Europe, with many of the most important things we'll see in Dutch art on display, including Rembrandt's Anatomy Lesson of Dr. Tulp. It's often, though not always the case, that a nation will produce its best work in all the arts at the same time. And one could argue that this happened in Rembrandt's day in Holland. Rembrandt, the greatest Dutch painter, was a contemporary of Van Kampen and de Keyser, usually considered to be the greatest Dutch architects. And as I said, de Keyser is also considered the greatest Dutch sculptor. <laughs> Swalink is considered the greatest Dutch composer, and Jus van den Vondel, whose statue you see here in the Vondel Park, named after him next to the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, is usually considered the greatest poet and dramatist to write the Dutch language. For all the importance of these other fellows and their contributions, however, the 17th century in Holland was essentially an age of paint, certainly one of the greatest ever. The public expression of Catholicism was nominally illegal in Holland, but as in England, many Catholics got along very well, including Vondel here, who managed to live to be 92. Judaism was also openly tolerated, and the great Jewish philosopher Benedict Spinoza lived near Rembrandt's house on the Jodenbreestraat, the Jew's Big Street as it was called. Vondel was a supporter, as a Catholic naturally would have been, of what was called the Arminian faction which favored peace with the Spanish Netherlands, and which was opposed by the so-called Gomorist faction, which supported the House of Orange and was more hawkish. The two factions were named after two professors at the University of Leiden. I mentioned Spinoza a minute ago, and it's probably fair to call him the most important Dutch philosopher. He was born in Amsterdam into a Jewish family which had emigrated from Portugal, he was, however, to be, in effect, excommunicated for his philosophical positions, the most well-known of which is pantheism, 
Whatsoever is, is in God, he says. This is obviously hard to reconcile with the way God is represented in the Old Testament. His pantheism leads to determinism. All is God, therefore all is determined by God. And this, it could be argued, leads to Calvinism. Determinism precludes ultimate moral distinctions. And this leads more or less to the Dutch Reformed Church, although he had some trouble with it also. So, though kicked out of the synagogue, he was not kicked out of Holland, and he was buried in a Protestant cemetery. Well, here we see Rembrandt now with his new bride, Saskia. At least I hope it's Saskia. In a picture painted the year they were married, 1634, and this makes an interesting comparison with the picture Rubens painted of himself and his bride. Superficially, it looked like Rubens was the secure, suave, and confident aristocrat, while Rembrandt comes across here as a kind of nouveau riche tosspot with a barmaid on his lap. I think that in the Rubens picture, we do see the real Rubens. He was suave and confident, but I'm not sure this is the real Rembrandt. Certainly, he had a right to celebrate at the time he got married. He was rich and successful, with an apparently never-ending series of commissions coming in. But while there was an extrovert in him, which at times made a public appearance like this, Rembrandt's genius was to be much more a product of introspection. Here's a portrait of Saskia, which is one of the most painstakingly detailed pictures he ever painted. But he could have raised her head a little to get rid of that double chin. I'm led to think that if she'd had a big pimple on the end of her nose while she was posing for this, he would have painted that too. Here's another self-portrait of Rembrandt now, painted the year that he bought his big house in Amsterdam. He was 33, on top of the world and looking here about as good as he could. This portrait is in the Norton Simon Museum in L.A. Rubens had, of course, bought a big house with a garden and then built a whole studio add-on so that the whole place took up about a city block. Rembrandt would use part of his house for a studio and had no garden. But even so, he had one of the finer private residences in Amsterdam. And although this kind of thing is difficult to evaluate, it may well have cost him more than Rubens cost him. Here's Rembrandt's house now as it looks today. The original step gable was replaced by a classical pediment in the 18th century. If you were to trade the gold in the guilders Rembrandt bought this for today, you would get it in the neighborhood of $650,000. He committed himself to 5% interest, which sounds good, but the average interest on a home loan in Amsterdam in the 1630s seems to have been 3% or less. In any case, the payments on this house were to prove to be one of the real problems in his life and certainly helped lead to his eventual financial collapse. Here you see part of the interior. It's not exactly clear how the house was arranged in Rembrandt's day or even what part of it was used as a studio because of extensive modifications of it that have taken place since the 17th century, but it's been restored in such a way as to convey something like the atmosphere of the original. None of the works of other artists now on the walls were there in Rembrandt's day, but he, again like Rubens, had a collection that would be the envy of many museums today. At the time of the bankruptcy auction of his possessions, he still owned dozens of his own paintings and dozens of others by artists from all over Europe, from Raphael in Italy to Van Eyck in Flanders. It's been estimated that his art collection, not counting his own paintings, cost him more than the house. The Rembrandt House Museum doesn't own any of his paintings, but they have copies of 143 of his etchings, about half the total, and they rotate the display of them. You can see a couple here. Rembrandt etchings like Durer engravings and woodcuts are within the budgets of uh, most people who want to collect art, whereas paintings by artists of that class can usually be bought now only by national governments. 
1991, 89 Rembrandt etchings were sold and brought an average of $20,000 each, but many sold for a thousand or so. A copy of Christ Presented to the People, only six prints of which are known, brought $900,000. Here's an etched self-portrait, also done the year he bought the house. In 1938, a tourist from North Carolina bought a box of junk at a Paris antique store that turned out to have 70 of Rembrandt's original etching plates in it. Until that discovery, it was thought that none survived. They're now in the Raleigh Museum in North Carolina. To make an etching, you cover a copper plate with wax, then scratch through the wax with a needle where you want the etching to print black, then you dip the plate in acid, which eats away the metal which has been exposed by the scratching. After the wax is removed, an ink-soaked pad is pressed onto the plate, and the excess ink is wiped off, leaving ink in the grooves etched by the acid. A piece of absorbent paper is then pressed down on the plate, and the ink is absorbed out of the grooves onto the paper. This is the way the Dolan Hotel in Amsterdam looks today. And as I mentioned earlier, this is where the Cloveneers Dolan Militia Company had its headquarters in Rembrandt's day, although they would not recognize this building. The militia companies were not really military in purpose, like, say, the National Guard. They were more like shooting clubs, the main purpose of which was social rather than soldierly. Their chief public function was to march in parades, and in 1638, they marched in when in honor of Marie de Medici, who was visiting Amsterdam in her search for someone to overthrow her son, Louis XIII. It's widely thought that the specific episode Rembrandt had in mind when he began working on the Night Watch was this parade. So here's Rembrandt by Rembrandt again, as he looked in 1642 when he began what was to be, by common consent today, his greatest painting, Legend has it, of course, that the members of the Cloveneers Dolan were dissatisfied with it, that it was viewed as a failure, so Rembrandt became an outcast and went broke. As late as the 1980s, KLM was running an ad in which you were invited to fly their airline to Amsterdam, and this is a quote, and see the painting which caused Rembrandt to be hooted down the road to bankruptcy. If you go to the Rijksmuseum and stand in front of it, however, one of the most colossal of all oil paintings, 400 square feet. You'll wonder how in the world anyone could have ever been dissatisfied with it, or how anyone could have ever believed anyone else could have been dissatisfied with it. It might be thought that some of the subjects would have been upset at being gift l given less prominence than some others, but most of the figures which are partially obscured, including Rembrandt himself in all likelihood, were simply added to the total to make the overall composition more impressive. The fact is that everyone connected with the project was entirely pleased, and Rembrandt didn't go broke for 15 years. It's true that it did come in for some criticism because of things like the apparently disorderly arrangement of figures, but it is now thought to so far surpass almost all other paintings of the type that it's even hard to find color pictures of other examples. Most of them are, like the anatomy lesson of Dr. Egbertson which we saw last time, essentially groups of portraits with no real attempt made to disguise their formal and posed character. The Night Watch is a much more Baroque work in that it shows the subjects doing something and stops the action at a dramatically effective point. The theatrical use of light is also, of course, a Baroque feature, and in Rembrandt's hands here it becomes a kind of surreal, magical illumination that produces an effect unlike that which would be produced by any real light. After the picture was cleaned about 1975, there was a lot of silly talk about it being 
so much brighter that we would now think of it as the day watch. But that's certainly misleading. This is not a plain air picture that Rembrandt painted on location. He made up the whole scene and the light to go with it. According to one 17th century authority, it made other such group portraits, all of them look like playing cards. And by it, says Sir Kenneth Clark, all modern painting stands condemned. Here you can see Captain Franz Banningcock on the left and his Lieutenant Willem von Reutenberg up closer. That Rembrandt was given this commission is certainly evidence that his previous work inspired confidence in people like these who had money to spend on such a picture. He had never painted anything remotely approaching this in size and scope. We're going to see some details from it now and hear an arrangement for brass of part of the Musicalisches Exequium by Heinrich Schutz, the greatest composer of Rembrandt's day. I should mention that the brightly lit girl carries a rooster with its claws up, the symbol of the Cloveneers, the Clawers Guild. She looks a lot like Rembrandt's pictures of Saskia. Also, some think the fellow peeking out at the very back, we only see one eye, is Rembrandt himself. <laughs> This is a sketch Rembrandt made of a lion, and I think this could almost pass as another self-portrait. In any case, Rembrandt was not in as happy a mood after completing the night watch as one might suppose. His mother had died shortly before he began it, then Saskia's sister died, then Saskia herself died of tuberculosis while he was still working on it. A few months before her death, she had given birth to their son Titus, but Rembrandt was now left a single father. If one is looking for reasons why Rembrandt's career might have changed course after the Night Watch, it makes more sense to look in his life rather than to any supposed failing of the Night Watch. 
losing one's mother and one's wife and being suddenly left with an infant son all in a period of a year or two could change a man's perspective. About the time he was working on the Night Watch, he also painted a portrait of the Amsterdam patrician, Andries de Graaf, which the subject apparently didn't like and for which painting he was slow to pay. This led to hard feelings between the two, and since de Graaf was an influential fellow, this episode might have led to some reduction in the number of portrait commissions Rembrandt would get. But the fact is that he painted no portraits on commission at all for the next 10 years, and de Graaf wasn't that influential. Rembrandt went from painting them almost exclusively to avoiding them altogether, for reasons that I think were more internal than external, more personal than social. The ten years from his arrival in Amsterdam to the painting of the Night Watch are easy enough to characterize as his portrait period, but the next ten years or so, sometimes called his transitional period, are more difficult to generalize about. For one thing, though, he made many of his finest etchings in this period, including this one of Clement de Jonge, who was the printer who reproduced the copies from the plates for him. We'll go on to see more etchings and hear more about the rest of his career then after the break. Mm -hmm.